This morning we have a message uh, that we've been working on in James. We've been going through this book, and it's a, it's a, like I've said a few times, it's a small book, but a powerful book. It's like every, every line of it sometimes, I'm like, I could just meditate just on this, and just so I can receive uh, what God has for me and try to implement this one thing. So today we're going to continue in James, and we're in James chapter 3 this morning, and we're going to be talking about the smallest, uh, maybe one of the smallest members of our body, you know, maybe physiologically the, the muscle of the tongue is, is quite large, but we're going to be talking about the tongue and the words, that our words, they have, they have power in them. There, there's, there, there's life in our words, there's death in our words, there's blessing in our words, there's curse in our words. Our words hold weight. And so we're going to learn, we're going to see today that what we do with our tongue is a life or death matter. And we'll see this in scripture this morning. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have gathered your family here this morning and that you are here with us desiring that we would receive from you. So Father, I pray that our hearts would be open, that our ears would be open, that we would be attentive to your spirit to receive exactly what you have for us. Help us to learn how to uh, train our tongue to be more like you, that Father, we would use our mouth to speak words of life and not death, that we would speak blessings and not curse. Father, that we would build people up and not destroy them. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, Ma uh, James chapter 3. Let's read this together. Uh, we're in James chapter 3. Remember, it's a, it's a small book, so you might miss over it, but if you hit Hebrews, it's right after that. So James chapter 3, starting in verse 1 this morning. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Yeah. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships for as an example. Although they, they are large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boats. Consider what a great force is set ablaze by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. Verse 7. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed, and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? May brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So we see here, James, Pastor James, is trying to get across a few, uh, a few points to us about our words. Uh, again, we, we know that our words, they have the ability to speak life or death. Uh, but we're going to see here as we go through James that he, he points out three main focuses here. That words will be judged, what we say will be judged, that words are powerful, and that words can change us. Specifically, the word that is Jesus. So words are words can be judged. Words are powerful, and the word can change us. But because uh, when we examine this, and, and starting off right away, James James says this: anyone who never is at fault in what they say is a perfect person. And so immediately when we read this, it, it throws James throws the attention to Jesus. Because, you know, if I examine myself, if we read, and I read that verse number two, I said, yes, I am at fault of saying wrong things. 
And, and maybe you in this room too, you're like, yeah, there's been times where I've, I've said a wrong word. And it's amazing to know that we have Jesus, who was, again, the Word made flesh. He was the perfect Word. He spoke perfectly everything that the Father had said. Jesus, he, he, he didn't speak on his own accord. He didn't speak in malice. He didn't speak, uh, you know, in those spur of the moment stressful situations when you fight at your wife or your spouse or your kids, and, you know, at the workplace, all of a sudden you get too stressed and you fight. Uh, Jesus was the perfect one. And so if I'm going to be one that wants my words to be perfect, I, I got to look to Jesus. I got, uh, Jesus, I need your words. I need you inside of me to help change me, right? So this week, we're going to be looking at the, the power of words, and next week, we're going to be talking about how do we change our words. Uh, help, us, help me get some, some insight how we're going to change our words. So it's going to be a two-part sermon here, and next week will be really important to come out again and, and to hear the second part. But first, let's examine this. Our words first, our words will be judged. So we know that in Romans 3, 23, it says that all have failed, all have failed at this. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So all of us have failed in the example that God is, that Jesus has given us of, of who God is. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'm the exact same way. And, and I think if, if, I know that when I stand by just my words alone, I, I stand condemned. I need somebody else, need somebody else's words to come in and take my place. Because let's look at this, the importance, the, the emphasis is on these words. Jesus makes it also. Not only James, but Jesus. So let's look at Matthew chapter 12 real quickly. Flip on over. Because Matthew chapter 12 is the words of Jesus talking about our words. Uh, and, and, you know, if I thought James was hard, Jesus sometimes, he even says some things a little bit more straightforward. So Matthew chapter 12 here, and we're looking at verse 36. Matthew 12 to 12, 36, it says this, But I tell you, this is Jesus speaking. I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Yeah. Wow. Then 37, he even goes a little further. It says, For by your words you will be acquitted, but by your words you will be condemned. So I know, I think just as James recognized, I understand that by my words, the things that I speak, the, those empty words, those anger-filled words, those words that are cutting towards other people, that I stand condemned by my own words. And Jesus says that I and us will stand at, at judgment and be accountable for every word we've said. Some of you, just like me this week, as I was studying this, goes, oh my. That's right. I know some of the words I've been saying. I, I know some of the <laughs> ways that I've been using my words towards other people. See, here, James also talks about this warning for teachers. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And I think about this because every other week I get to come up here, or, or sometimes a few weeks in a row, get to come up here and I get to say many words. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, God, help me, help me, because I, I, I need to be sure that I'm speaking your words, and, and not words that come from myself. Amen. But this isn't so much a, I, I believe, not only is it, uh, should we, sorry, I don't think James is saying that we should be afraid of speaking. If anything, we see in the story of Scripture that we should be speaking, we should be sharing, we should be telling truth to other people. However, particularly in this environment, a, a teacher was a position of, of power. If somebody had a position of a teacher, they had, they had power, they, they had authority, they, there, was a, there was a position. So people would seek after, if they could get this title of teacher, it was a position of, of, of power, it was a position of authority, it was a position of influence. And oftentimes, people would seek it not out of love. I want to help somebody with my words. I want to encourage somebody with my words. I want to lift somebody up with my words. I want to teach them all the truth that I have of Jesus. I want to share. It wasn't, a, it wasn't something that they sought after in love. It was something that they sought after in pride. Yeah. So the, this, this encouragement by James is, if you become a teacher, don't, don't become a teacher in pride. Don't become a teacher just to get the title because other people are going to look up to you. Because if you get it only for that reason, be careful what you say. Because your words hold weight. 
that your words that you say are, are going to influence people's lives. And that's something pastors as I, or every one of our missional community leaders, when they're sharing, I mean, that's something we hope. And we don't, what we say, we don't want to say it in pride. We want to say it in love to encourage, to build up, and to lift up, and to build up in Jesus. So we should also, James saying, we should also have that same goal in mind. It's a sobering thought to think that the things that I say could lead somebody astray. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to, we don't want to take this position in pride, but we want to take it in joy. Hey, can I, how can I speak in love, like we know Ephesians says, to build people up into Christ, mm -hmm. build our family up. Because if anything, James is saying here, that our words are not neutral. Our words are never neutral. Our words have the power, again, to speak life, to speak death, to bless or to curse, to build up or to tear down. There's never a neutral stance in the things that we say. The first thing is that our words will be judged. Be careful, be full of love when we're speaking words. Secondly, our words are powerful, they accomplish much. Amen. So we look here, verses 3 through 6 today, and we're, we're seeing this uh, object, the, the horse and the, all the different animals, they're controlled, they're able to be tamed, and a ship, it's a huge thing, and compared, comparative to the whole of the ship, the rudder is really actually a, a very small, uh, a small piece of the whole ship. But with this small piece, it turns... The whole ship around. Or with the little bit in a mouse, I love, we would go to Kentucky, uh, Rachel's from Louisville, Kentucky, so they have the Kentucky Derby. It's this great thing, they have all these horses, and they're all oh, beautiful horses, they're taken care of really well, and they, they, they race the horses and things of that nature, and you can go down there and see these. I mean, they're, they're really huge animals. I don't know how many of you guys have, have been on farms to see, mm -hmm. to see a horse in person, but these race horses, I mean, they're like beast size. They're, they're huge. They're beautiful. But all it takes is a little bit in their mouth. And it can control. The rider can control exactly where he's going to go, how he's going to turn. And as they get to know the animal, they can tame the animal and, and, and are able to do wonderful things with it. And our, our tongues, the things that we say with our mouth, it, it's the exact same way. So why does this tongue this small, relative small thing compared to the whole of who we are, why does it control every area of our body? You ever think about that? Why does this, why do our tongue, this small thing, have such great power? Jesus brings a, a powerful truth to this. So if we turn again back to Matthew chapter 12, And we're going to look at verse 34, right before the one that we read before. Why does this small thing have such great power? So it says here in verse 33, uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Make a, good, make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brought of vipers. He's talking to the religious leaders. How can you, who are evil, say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good things stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up with him. So, why does this small thing control every area of our life? Why does it have so much control? Because the tongue is directly linked to the heart. Now we know if we're studying biology, we, we say, okay, that's not a direct link to the heart. But is, as a spiritual thing, the things that we say, the things that we speak, are in direct correlation to what's in our heart. And then again, I say, oh, James, you're, 
you're speaking a little hard. Holy Spirit, you're speaking a little hard. To and so the things that I say actually are come out of the things that are in my heart. So if I'm one that is speaking life or speaking and uh, speaking truth and encouraging and uplifting people, then it, it's a reflection of what's inside my heart. But those moments in time where I find anger and hateful and malice and, and, and words that tear down and words that, that cut other people, you know, when I find those words coming out of my heart, the, the symptom is the red flag to us, the sirens that should go off inside of us is there's something inside of my heart, there's something inside of me that is not good. It's the things that are out of our mouth are only produced out of the bad things inside of our heart, inside of who we are. But we can rejoice in the fact that our heart, controlled and completely submitted to the Holy Spirit, can bring about speech that brings life. A tongue controlled by the Holy Spirit is useful for building other people up, mm -hmm. is useful for bringing life, is useful for blessing. Yes. As I was listening to one of my favorite speakers uh, share, he was talking about his young daughter so there was a moment in the house where, where he had came home and, and he was really upset about different situations that were happening and there was stress in his life and so he was just venting at home and he was just sharing all this all this terrible stuff. And his and his and his sweet daughter, only twelve years twelve years old at the time, said said to her dad, Dad, I, I don't think those words come from Jesus. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the moment where we have a, a small one in the house and, that, and then I get to see this, the reflection of Jesus in me or maybe the lack thereof sometimes and say, oh my, it's true the word says also that out of the mouth of babes are, there's, there's speech that is truth, there's speech that is wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. So even at a young age, our, our tongues have this ability uh, the things that we say are a life or death matter. They are full of life or they are full of death. Amen. Yeah. When we're full of the Holy Spirit, we want to know that we, what we say will be something that, that builds one another up, not tear things down. In, in James chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, we see that our tongues are like a blazing fire. Earlier in the chapters in James, we talked about that uh, the things that we do can cause a stain, can cause something to be, to be uh, against us. But here we again are reminded that our tongues are powerful enough to destroy a whole fire, a whole forest, one little spark. And when we're in California, we'd know that there'd be a lightning strike or something like that, and there'd be a blaze, a wildfire would just go because everything was, was dry. Um, the tongue is the same way. It can bring great destruction, a warning to us, but also it can bring great encouragement. It can bring curse on somebody, but it could also be powerful enough to, to bless others. Every animal, it says here, every animal can be tamed. But the tongue is not going to be so. Yeah. Why do we have such power? Why is it, why is it, why do we have such power in our words? We have this power because we've been made in the image of God. That's right. Now think about this. God, the one that spoke the whole world into existence out of nothing, just with a single word, he says now he creates men and he, he creates women and he creates them in his image. He creates them with the exact same kind of power that, that he has himself. So why do we have such power? Why are our words so powerful? Why are our words can be so useful? It's because we have the same image that God has. That we have the same power that he has in his words. True. We don't take this lightly. We have the same ability to speak something into reality. We're going through a class yesterday. I spent, uh, Rachel and I, continuing on this journey of adoption, uh, spent eight hours yesterday in a class. And the whole time, we're telling, there's a, a lady, uh, she was so awesome. She's teaching us uh, and training us, but most of the time she was telling us stories. 
and stories of children that she has fostered. She had fostered 12 children and adopted five of those. So she had a, a household of, she had a 17 passenger van that she, you know, carried around her family in. And she was telling us stories of these children that have gone through foster care things. They've gone through sometimes crazy abuses and, and neglect. And things that people have spoken over their lives over and over again, curses that they've spoken over these children's lives over and over again, till these children think that they're nothing. They think that this is the norm, that what love is, is that people hate me, and people speak, speak cursed words toward me, that people abuse me physically, and that, that's their whole life. And then you have a chance, as a parent that, that adopts, to bring to them new life. And she told us terrible examples, and for, uh, for the sake of, uh, of guarding those stories, I, I won't say, say in too much detail, but she tells of all these stories of these children, and then the opportunity that she has then to speak life into them. And, I, and I'm excited about this opportunity that we have as, as, as getting ready parents, as each one of us in this room, those that are parents, those that are without children, that, that we have to speak life into our children. That we get to speak a word over them that, that others are not. Yes. You know, some of these children that we're thinking about uh, adopting in these foster care systems, they, they have developmental delays and they have different delays because of all the abuse and all the neglect that they faced in their life. And so the world has told them a certain thing. Uh, the world has told them, hey, you're going to be in this category. She, she talked about two brothers that she had adopted and they had never had any social interaction other than with themselves. And so they were locked away in a room, and they learned, uh, they learned basically how to communicate with each other by making up their own language. So they, different clicks, different sounds they'd make would mean different things, and they had a language that only they could understand. And so she went to, uh, immediately uh, when they were adopted, she went to a psychiatric evaluation and some counselors and were seeing, you know, how this child is and where they're at, and, and the doctor said to them that, these children will never live a full life. And depending on their, because of the way they evaluated, and, and her maybe a little bit prideful, but maybe a, a little bit believing in who God is, said, oh, that's a challenge. <laughs> and so they, they made a, a follow-up appointment in six months, and she said, for six months, man, all I did was speak love over them. We were able to show them affection and, and care for them and, and introduce them to, to language and to art and, and, and spoke good words over them and spoke about their future. And so in six months, they came back. And, and at this moment, the, the, the child was, had learned about some art. And, and she said, I found out this child just loves designing things and creating things. And so we, we got him some pen and paper and all these coloring books and, and, and markers and crayons and all these things that he could just express himself. And, and she found that he's extremely artistic. And so they, they bring him back a six month appointment and he's down and he's drawing something and the, and the doctor comes in and, and says, oh, is he, is he trying to draw something? And the little child looks up and in English uh, it just expresses to him exactly the details of what he was drawing. And the doctor was taken aback, like, whoa, so, I mean, like, it is the same kid that, that we just saw six months ago. Our tongues have power to produce yes. life. Amen. As people that are interacting with children here at church or in our homes, your children, or even your co-workers and other people, there's been words spoken over people that have limited who they are. Yeah. They've been a curse to them. Yes. And as ones that are full of the Holy Spirit, our opportunity is to speak life into situations, yes. to speak blessings over people, to relieve them of the curses of the things that have been spoken over them. Our words have power. We know this even in a, in a marriage relationship, or even when we're interacting with friends, and, and maybe somebody's trying out something new. I didn't tell Rachel I was going to use an example, um, but you know, as, as Rachel, she's doing, doing art. She's learning how to do different things, and, and painting, and, and creating different things right now. You know, and, and sometimes she's learning different strokes, and learning different things, and so sometimes I, I love, um, I'm a critical person. I like to, <laughs> you know, I, I examine things, I'm like, okay, I want to, this is how things should be done. 
And I have to be careful at times, the words that I speak about the things that she's creating, as she's learning how to express these things. And I'm like, man, some of the things she's doing, I'm like, I can never do. And, and, and then I get sometimes this comparison, well, well it's not like this is, this is where, you know, Mozart, or not Mozart, he's a, he's a piano player, here's an artist. Picasso. Picasso. Right, you, you got these, these perfection, and they're like, well, okay, co compared to Picasso or Michelangelo or something, like maybe it's not, not, where, not where those are, but I have an opportunity to, in those moments, to speak life, to speak and to build up. And so we have to be careful, even in those things, as, as our brothers and sisters around us are trying and attempting new things, as our children are attempting new things and creative things, and, and maybe they're trying to figure out what, what is their strengths are, what are their, their weaknesses are. Man, in those moments, we have to remember, hey, we have an ability in this moment, whether we can stifle things, we can curse things, or we can build it up. We can encourage it, we can speak life over it, we can speak into existence what isn't there. This is the power, this is the ability we have in our tongue. Because here we have to be careful about speaking over those also created in God's image. Yes. So when we're, de when we're defaming a person, when we're speaking curses, when we're speaking death over people, whether it be our family members, whether it be our co-workers, whether it be our neighbors or a particular group of people, we're not just defaming that person. We're not just speaking death to that person. But James here reveals that we're speaking to the image of God. So when we say curse and when we say death to specific situation, those also are a reflection of what we're speaking to God. So the people are still in the image of God. So our, our words have power because we're in the image of God, but then we're speaking, when we speak words, what we're speaking over people, we're actually speaking to God. Because we are created, those people are created in the image of God. Mother Teresa says that says it this way, that whenever I meet somebody in need, it's really Jesus in his most distressed disguise. Uh -huh. Mother Teresa was somebody that cared for many, many people. Most needy people. Whenever I meet somebody in need, it's really Jesus in his most distressing disguise. So when we get that perspective about the people that are around us, Maybe they're hard, maybe they're difficult, maybe this stressful situation, maybe, maybe things are challenging for us, maybe it's not exactly the way, way you want it to be done, or, or, that, or in that nature. But if we get a different image of who they are, that they're really in the image of God, that they're really representation of Jesus, it can change the way I speak over them. It changes the way I, I act towards them. It changes the way what I do towards them. There's another nun that, that was in a situation, she writes a, a, a book and she says that there's a specific nun in, in her uh, area that was really difficult to get along with. She's like, oh, she's so hard. Like, every time she comes around and she brings stress, or every time she goes, she has a word, a critical word, and it's just, it's tough to be around her, she, she explained in, in, in her writing. But she also took these words serious, said, hey, I want to treat her like she is Jesus. Like she is Jesus in distress. In Proverbs chapter 10, it says that he is prudent who keeps his mouth shut. Yeah. So every time she was around this person, she would keep her mouth shut, she, and, oh, okay, I, I'm going to put on a smile. So every time she saw her, she would put on a smile, she would be excited, she would, you know, bless her, and, and have a good time with her, and, and she was just so sweet to her. So at one point, this uh, the other nun comes to her, she says, why, why do I bring you so much pleasure? Why, 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 do, why do you smile so much when I'm around? And then she's able to say again to her that Jesus is what makes the bitterness sweet, that 
as, I, as you come to me, I treat you just as I would Jesus. But wouldn't that be amazing? Think about this. The person in your life right now that causes you the most stress. The person in your life that, that causes you the most angst. The person in your life that, man, you have the hardest time speaking good words to. The, that individual, you, you have them in their mind, right? If they would come to you and ask you, why do I bring you so much pleasure? I know right now there's some individuals that maybe in my life that, would say, that probably wouldn't say that about me. I need help. I need Jesus. 1 John says this, How do you say you love a God who you haven't seen if you cannot love a brother who you have seen? Mm -hmm. Or a sister, or a spouse, or a co-worker, or, or a child. We need to be a body that speaks life to one another, that can have confidence that when we get around our brothers and sisters in this room, when we get around our family that we call church, that we're just one to be confident that we're going to bring words of life, words that build up, words that encourage, words that, that bring life into our being. Are, do we have words that bring life or death? Do we have words that are full of forgiveness or are they full of condemnation? Uh, do we have words that are encouraging? Are they words that are discouraging? Remember, what we say with our tongues is a life or death matter. Mm -hmm. So we get into this, this thing. We find our words will be judged. We can stand condemned for the even empty words that we say. Our words are powerful. We can speak life. We can encourage. We can build people up. Or our, uh, and then the third thing that we, we find here is our words can change us. Words can change us. Amen. Yes. Specifically, the yes. word. Jesus can change us. So how do we change us? How do we take control? How do we, how, how do we avoid the fire? How can we tame this unruly tongue? Matthew chapter 12 again, verse 35, 33 and 35 says, Good fruit, the good trees produce good fruit. Bad fruit is produced by bad trees. So what we need this morning is a heart transplant, a heart change. If we're going to be ones that are going to want to speak love, speak blessings, and be encouraged, we need to be ones that seek after the Holy Spirit, seek after submission to Him, seek after it so that our hearts be transformed by the words of God, and when we speak to one another, it brings life. Amen. Fresh water can't be produced out of a well that has salt water. Figs cannot grow on an olive tree. These things can't happen. So what is the solution? We are in need of Jesus. Amen. Jesus was the Word made flesh. He is the one that spoke. Everything He spoke was good. Everything He spoke was perfect. We need a substitute for what we've been speaking. Ones that are good and pleasing. Words in place of ours. And that's Jesus. I'm so glad that we have somebody that spoke a better word for me. Because I know yes. that by my words alone, I stand condemned. But by His words, I stand acquitted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I stand free. He is the one that speaks a better word over us. Because we are accountable for the words that we say. But He speaks a word of forgiveness over us. When we are down, and we're out, and we're discouraged, and, and He finds us in our fiery pit, and, and without Him, He's the one that speaks love over us. He's the one that speaks truth over us. He's the one that speaks encouragement and builds us up into who we are in Christ, and who we are in the Father. He is the one that has authority in His words, and the things that He says must come true. Man, I want some of those words in my life. I want some of those words in my family. I want some of those words in my neighborhood and in my, in, in my workplace. And if he speaks words, his words are full of acceptance. They're full of love. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They're full of things. Man, you can change. He's speaking these words to us this morning. Do you believe those better words? Do you believe that he actually has the final word in our life? 
No word that we speak, no word that somebody else speaks over your life, no word can outweigh or outdo the word that he has for That's us. Right. That word, the word of Jesus, is continually interceding on our behalf. He's continually speaking to the Father. And he's not speaking to the Father all the bad things that we've done. Sometimes we'll believe it. It's just that Jesus is up there just accusing us of all the bad things. He's pointing out to the Father. Hey, you did that wrong again. You did that wrong again. Oh, watch out. She spoke that wrong word. No, he's not speaking. He's not the accuser of the brother. That's the, that's the enemy. The enemy is the one accusing. But Jesus is actually speaking. With the Father, He's interceding on our behalf. He's speaking to each one of us. He's speaking about each one of us. He's speaking words of love over us. He's telling the Father how great we are. Hey, Father, help them out. Hey, Father, can we assist them in this? Can we build them up in this area? Can we speak these words? The, the, Jesus has the better words for us, and He's continually speaking to the Father on our behalf. I need his words because I know if, if Matthew chapter 12 is correct that I stand condemned by the empty words and the words that I have spoken but I need Jesus to speak that life that forgiveness that truth that freedom Satan sin and death do not have the final word hallelujah we can have confidence in that brokenness of sin, it doesn't have the final word. Christ, hope, has the final word. Christ, truth, has the final word. I always pray this, that I don't let myself forget the word that Jesus has spoken over me. Yeah. I want to encourage us the same way to pray that prayer. Jesus, don't let me forget the words that you've spoken over me. Because yeah, right. there's many different things spoken over us. There's discouraging words. There's, there's challenging the words. There's, there's, there's words that we're not good enough. There's words that, hey, we're not patient enough. There's, there's words that we can't make it. There's, there's all these different words. But Jesus speaks a better word. And not only does he speak a better word for us in this room this morning, he speaks a better word for the, our children that are downstairs, the children that are there. He speaks a better word for this neighborhood, for this city. He speaks a better word for those who have not yet to come to him. That's what gets me excited about inviting them to come and hear. Come and hear the words that are much better. Come and hear the words that are encouraging. Come and hear the words that are life-giving. Come and hear the words that are refreshing. Family, do you need to hear the words this morning? Speak over you truth. I want to invite you this morning to stand. I say, Andrew, I want to be one that speaks a better word. I want to produce good words that bring life, that bring blessing, the words that build up. I want to be uh, one. I want my tongue to be under submission to God. I want, I want to bring forth life. That's you this morning. I want to invite you to stand up.